Hi, in this video, I'm going to talk about how you can actually extract stress strain material models out of a experimental data that you have for a tension test that undergoes necking. This is part three of a series. In part one, I talked about how you can model a, a dog bone shaped specimen that undergoes necking if you have a material model. I show that you can find out the cold drawing ratio, you can understand the deformation and force displacement results, and that's very easy. In part two, I talked about how you can attempt to get stress strain at an integration point or a specific location in a specimen that you have tested experimentally. And I show that that's really hard to do. I show that that was, in fact, probably not the best idea to get a ex experimental data that you can use for material model calibration. Today, today I'm going to talk about a better way, a better way to take data from a tension specimen that undergoes necking and then convert that uh, into a stress strain material model. So that's really the focus here. The first step to do this is to first make sure you have some experimental data to work with. So it could be that you have experimental data for some material that you're already interested in. In this case, what I'm going to do, though, is in something different. I'm going to select the material model. I'm going to simulate the force displacement behavior of a specific shaped dog bone, just like I did in part one of my series. And here you can see a force displacement curve that was generated with a known material model. And then I'm going to try to find a material model that matches this force displacement curve. So I'm not attempting to get the local stress strain at some point in the specimen. I'm going to go and try to calibrate the model to the force displacement data directly. So so that's my starting point. The second step is really to create a, a finite element model of my specimen. In my example today, I'm going to use Abacus for that. I created a very coarse uh, mesh specimen in Abacus. Here's an image that you can see. It is C3D20 elements, and I'm displacing the top straight up, and I keep the bottom fixed. And then I can use this to figure out the, the response and calibrate the material model to that. Once you're done at creating your, uh, the finite element model of your specimen, you can take a look at the input file that you export from it. So here's an uh, exported uh, finite element file in Abacus IMP format. If I scroll to the bottom, there are a few things that one needs to do here for this to work properly. The first one is specifying the material model. So right now, we're just going to put in the dummy material model. I'm using an elastic material model, star elastic. It doesn't matter. We will replace this later on with the material model that we want to calibrate. The second thing is that we need to have a step definition here where we output and history output. Here it is. You can see that it shows the node output for the top surface, top elements. And I want to extract the reaction force and the displacement. And from that, uh, we will use that information to, to drive the calibration. And finally, the third part here is that we need to make sure that we apply the this boundary displacement exactly that was done in your experiment. So if you run a real experiment, you have to extract the displacement versus time data and feed that into as an amplitude curve here. In my case, I just did it monotonically, so it's very simple. I, I moved this top 20 units, 20 millimeters, and it took 100 seconds in this case. So this is my template that I would use for, material, for the material model calibration. The next thing to do is to uh, set up M calibration to use the experimental data that you have, either generated through experiments or through the inverse simulation approach that I talked about. I'm going to just create a new load case uh, by going to load case here and do Abacus external solver. I'm going to select the experimental data file. And then I need to select which columns are which. The default settings are correct in this case. The next thing I need to do is to select the Abacus input file that represents the specimen and the boundary conditions that, I, that, that was used for this case. So we already generated that. I'm just going to select it. And then we need to say to uh, M calibration, how many CPUs should Abacus use? Well, let's pick one here for now. Um, what material mode should be replaced? The default here is correct as well and which direction was the force applied in. So it's going to pick these. I'm going to plot force displacement. And here it is. The next step is to select the material model. I 
want to make sure I don't start with the correct answer because that would really defeat the purpose of this exercise. So instead, I'm going to pick a material model that's very different than what the actual material in this uh, case was. So I'm picking a material model for ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. And uh, those are the predictions here in dashed lines. The solid lines are the experimental data that I'm really going to try to match in the end. That's data for the polycarbonate. So here's my prediction uh, that I'm going to start with. I'm going to try to optimize the parameters from this point. So I can simply copy this material model from this window that contains the ultra high molecular weight material model. And then I paste that into my M calibration window here. Now, there's one more thing I will do. I will add a load case for Poisson's ratio. And there it is. I can now actually calibrate this material model to this data. I just start a run calibration and let it run for a number of hours. And then M calibration will modify these parameters to try to match this force displacement data and the Poisson's ratio data all at once. After running this for a while, uh, I ended up with the results shown here. So the dashed red line is the prediction of the calibrated T and V model in this case. Here it is, it goes up and it goes down. It looks actually pretty decent uh, when it compared to the force displacement result. And um, I now have calibrated the model. What's really interesting is I can take this material model and I can compare it to the actual model that was used to generate the force displacement data to see if this calibration was able to reproduce it, even though I started from a quite a different starting point. So I'm just gonna copy this material model and I'm gonna go to another window of M calibration, I paste in material model, and I run it once. Um, and when you do that, you will see that in this particular case, the predictions are reasonably good. It's not exactly right, but it's reasonably good. It matches the strain rate dependence, the shape of the curves, and most of the aspects of this material behavior. And this is true stress, true strain predictions of this uh, material. So. What I showed here is that you can start with a material model that is not what it's supposed to be. You calibrate it to force displacement data, and you can uh, represent the actual data that you got in the experiment. So this is a better way of getting a material model from a tension specimen that undergoes snaking compared to what I talked about in my second uh, uh, video in this series when I tried to do that from integration point data or node point data based on DIC. So this is my approach solution to this problem. It's a little time consuming, and uh, you don't need to do this if the material does not neck. If it doesn't neck, it is much quicker to simply extract the force displacement or stress strain from that using DIC in your real experiments. But if you do have necking, it's really hard to analyze that data, as I showed. In that case, using the approach that I showed here would be a preferred method in order to get an accurate material model. And it's all automatic. Within M calibration, once you set up your finite element simulation and let Abacus reiterate on the particular material model you're interested in. So that's all I have to say about this. If you have any questions, you can ask them below.